It is truly a great joy and honor to be with you. And I want to say thank you to those who asked and invited me to come. As Curtis said, it was true 14 years ago I stood on this very same place, one week away from resigning the church where I had pastored for about five years. And in that moment and in that time of speaking, many people here in this conference poured themselves out to me and gave me great love and great support, touched me very deeply, loved me very much, and helped me through a very difficult time. Would you take your Bibles with me, please, and turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20. We're going to be looking at this farewell address that Paul gave to the Ephesian elders. And you may wonder, what does that have to do with my topic today about nurturing new lambs? But we hope to give you several ideas here, not only for those who are in the ministry called to preach the gospel, but for every believer to understand what God has called all of us to do, to understand what He wants of us and what He expects of us. Would you stand with me as I read aloud from God's Word, Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy." And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves." Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. Would you bow and pray with me, please? Dear Holy Father, we come in the wonderful name of the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, our Savior and our Redeemer. And Father, we come today with hearts full of joy and gladness, full to overflowing because of who you are, because of who Jesus Christ is, and what he has done for poor sinners like us. We bless you and we thank you for the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection and the ascension. We rejoice to know that our Savior ever lives to intercede for us. And Lord, in this conference, I pray that you will use your servant today 
And give me the word that I might speak boldly and as I ought to speak regarding this sober and yet exciting challenge of shepherding the flock of God. We submitted ourselves to you as under shepherds as best we know our hearts. We want to come to the end of our journeys hearing you say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. So Lord, we stand before you like the prophets of old and say, Speak, O Lord, for we would hear in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. I am glad this time has finally arrived. It was about a year ago that I was asked to preach on this topic of the doctrines of grace and the Christian minister in the nurture of new lambs. And I can remember thinking as I agree to do that. Those, that old saying, maybe you've heard it before, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And I was thinking to myself, that must be true for me. And that thought has stayed with me these many months as I have looked forward to this time to speak to you about something that means so very much to me and others. And then another thought occurred to me, and it's this, it is a frightening thing to stand before a congregation and preach when probably everyone who's in that congregation knows more about the topic than you yourself know. And I can hardly, uh, honestly tell you rather, it is even more difficult to preach to pastors more than any other group of people with the, the, with the sole exception of maybe college or seminary professors. So I'm glad this time has arrived so the torture can finally stop and I can begin to breathe again. So if you'll look with me in Acts chapter 20, we're going to see what a topic this is. This business of shepherding God's flock. As we ponder this, the question that was raised by the Apostle Paul comes to mind here. Who is sufficient for these things? Who is able to shepherd the flock of God? Who is able to do this? Who is sufficient to preach about shepherding God's flock? And I want to base the message today on this part of Scripture here in Acts chapter 20. Familiar passage to all of you. And in verse 24, Paul even gives sort of a summation of the ministry. He says, it was received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I wonder, and I'm sure maybe you're wondering too, how many men even stand before the people of God anymore and even think like that, that this came from Jesus, and the reason is that we testify to the gospel of the grace of God. How many even think like that anymore? For the purpose of testifying to the gospel of the grace of God. If you haven't underscored that verse in your Bible, verse 24, I would encourage you to do that. It's a great verse. This would be a good time to do that, to remember what God has called us to do. It's received from Him to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. This is certainly one of the most riveting and powerful passages in all the Word of God. Paul is on his way to the city of Jerusalem, and he stops at Miletus, and he asks for the elders from Ephesus to come so that he might meet with them and give them a, a final word, a, a message of God to them. Paul knew that afflictions were ahead of him. He says it down there in verse 23. He even says, The Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. So this was not a surprise to Paul. He knew what was coming. He knew that he would not see the brethren again. He says that down in verse 25. You will see my face no more. This was his last meeting with them. And he shared with them... And it was a very emotional and moving experience. You saw at the close of the chapter there. It says they, they wept freely. They fell on his neck and they kissed him. Well, I'm not going to give you a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of this long passage today of all these verses, but I will give you somewhat of a division here in these, in these first verses, 18 through 21. First of all, we see Paul reviewing his ministry, looking back over it, seeing what he had done among these elders. And then in verses 22 through 27, Paul announces the afflictions that are awaiting him. He says it there in verse 23, change in tribulations. And then in verses 28 through 35, Paul says to these Ephesian elders, he gives to them rather a very solemn charge, a very important word. And then the whole chapter 20 closes with this tearful parting down there in verse 37. They all wept freely, fell into Paul's neck and kissed him. 
They bid farewell to the beloved apostle there. Now this passage of scripture gives us a wonderful basis for us to consider this theme of of nurturing new lambs and shepherding God's flock. There are three parts of this message I want to share with you today sort of to put our minds around or pitch our mental tents around, if you will. I want to talk to you who are pastoring about three things and then even those of you who are not pastoring. The first one is, of co- first of all, of course, you as the pastor. And secondly, the flock that we pastor, that we shepherd under God's guidance. And then finally, your neck, pastors. Your neck is on the line here. And you saw a little reference to that down there in verse 37. Maybe not like what you think when you hear someone say that, but it's the same for you as it was for Paul. I hope we have no homiletical police here because I doubt that this particular structure will pass muster, as they say. But those are the three parts or points of my sermon today. I want to talk to you about you as pastors. I want to talk to you about your flock. And I want to talk to you about your neck. So let's begin here in verse 28 with a word to these pastors. Paul is speaking to the elders, the pastors there, the under shepherds. And he says something in verse 28. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves. Please notice that phrase. This is Paul's first exhortation to them. Take heed to yourselves. Take heed means to give attention to. James Alexander says it means to give attendance to. It means to pay very special attention to something. The picture here is of one who is walking through very dangerous terrain where there's all kinds of traps and pitfalls and snares. And pastors, if you're seeing your day and you've heard that, you know that's true, don't you? You know that's true. They're on every side. And where you don't walk carelessly or casually along, but you carefully pick your way as you go because you understand this is dangerous ground. Paul chooses that term to convey to these men how very important it was for them to watch themselves. He says, take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves, he says, to give attention to themselves. And in speaking this way to these men, the Apostle Paul is also speaking to us today. And he says to all of us today as pastors to take heed to yourselves. Can you imagine this morning if more pastors would take heed to themselves how much more garbage we would not have to deal with? Folks, we are still in some places paying for the sins of TV ministers from the late 1980s. There are still some people say, ah, you're all alike. Well, that's not true at all. But the stigma of that, the scandal of that still stands even years after. Brothers in Christ, to a very alarming measure, your flock, the spiritual well-being of your flock, hinges upon your own spiritual well-being. If you want your flock to be healthy, then you must be healthy. If you are off your feet, as they say on the farm, the flock you shepherd is going to be off its feet. If you are spiritually ill or sick, you're not going to be able to doctor the flock. And you're not going to be able to guard against predators. One of the main things that shepherds do, under shepherds do, is not only feed the flock, but protect the flock, guard the flock. If you've become prey yourself, how can you possibly protect the flock? I don't know of a more terrifying thing that I've already said to you. That is, the spiritual well-being of your flock hinges on your own spiritual well-being to a very large measure. Sadly enough today, brethren, we have to admit that there are many trying to shepherd a flock today who are in a very poor position to do so because they are spiritually ill. I said a moment ago that you can't doctor the flock if you yourself are spiritually ill. And there are many spiritually ill among us today. Many spiritually ill, quote, shepherds, unquote, in pulpits today. I don't have time to list all of the illnesses that are out there which afflict the shepherds today. But we can talk about the illness of professionalism. John Piper's got a great book, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals, dealing with that very idea. Oh, my friends, there is nothing that's afflicting the pastors of our day more than this professionalism where after we've done this for a while, we get pretty good at this and we don't think much about this. We don't have our hearts in this anymore. 
It's something to be feared and guarded against. After we've done this for a while, folks, you know how this is. You get used to it. People say, how can you stand up there and speak to people? When you've done this hundreds of times, this is not like the first time, is it? It's not like that. You get used to this to some degree. And before you know what has happened, we master this craft of sermon making and we preside over the services and before we know it, we are just doing that without feeling anything. Well, it's another Sunday. It's another Sunday night. It's another Wednesday night. We're not even being touched by the Spirit of God at all. And we wonder why there's no power in the pulpits anymore. Because the Spirit of God is not there anymore. Because we are just going through the motions. We are, as one person put it, trafficking in unfelt truth. So beware of being sick with professionalism while you're trying to minister to the flock of God. And there are many other things as well. That's not the only illness that's in the pulpits today. There are many men today who are sick with the world's thinking and doing. I constantly hear strong warnings about the dangers of fundamentalism. Oh, the fundamentalists are going to ruin us, they say. But no one seems to see any danger at all in trendamentalism. Where you always chase after the latest fad. And have you noticed this about the church today? When they're chasing these fads, they find themselves forever chasing. They get maybe close enough to maybe catch up with one. And as soon as they catch up, the fad is changed and they're off to something else. The crowd has moved on to the next newest fad. You're destined to be a widower, men, if you marry this age and the spirit of this age. But there are many men today who have laid aside the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ so they can embrace the latest and the newest and the coolest. Because you understand, we're hearing this over and over again. If you want to reach people, you must be cool. Don't you understand? I tell you, they are sick with an infatuation with the world's thinking and doing. We must be very careful, for we can also become sick with the illness of ambition. Not just professionalism and trendamentalism, but ambition. A spirit that makes you look upon your flock as a means of personal advancement. A dear friend of mine has just published a book after serving for many years in the ministry. And I want to quote something he wrote in his book that I think is very appropriate and very useful right now. He starts off with this comment from Michael Horton where he says, Instead of trying to make the Bible relevant for today's busy Christian, I suggest that we allow the Bible to arrest us, condemn us, justify and free us. We need more preaching that focuses on God and what He has done, is doing, and will do in history, and less on ourselves and how we can be happier with God's help. And you know that's what's happening in pulpits. Rather than the Word of God, well, God is our cosmic cheerleader. And God's our buddy, don't you know? I wish preachers would believe in preaching, folks. What has God called us to do? To preach the Word. And I thank God for those that do. I know this church has one. But sadly, many do not. Everywhere I look in Southern Baptist context, I, I see this flight from preaching, running from preaching. Sunday evening services are becoming so increasingly rare and many of those that remain are not even given to preaching. Well, we'll do something other than preaching. And you've seen this. Folks, this happens in the little churches where I am in Franklin County. Well, let's do something other than preaching. Let's sing or let's have some kind of slideshow or whatever or drama. Or maybe here's the latest, coolest thing, interpretive dance. How about that? Now, have you noticed something about that? Why is it always women doing the dancing? Why is that? Hello? You know what I'm talking about. No one wants to see a big fat guy like me up there strutting around. They want to see some smooth chick up there sh shaking it. You know what I'm saying? You know what's going on. The reason it's so hard to get a crowd together for a preaching service on Sunday evenings, there's no point in trying. A lot of pastors, I'm saying, well, we gave up on Sunday nights a long time ago. Sad fact is that many pastors are giving in to their situation rather than trying to change it. Now, folks, it's not just a matter of giving up on services that once provided preaching. It is possible to have a preaching service, I know you know this, and not have any real preaching. You know that. It's possible to meet and say we're going to have preaching, but there's not any real preaching. That may very well be the reason that so many have stopped coming back on Sunday nights. 
But I hope that men, you're like me, that you believe preaching is a tremendous, tremendous privilege. And I'm persuaded that our people desperately need it today. You think about this for a minute. The general sermon, or the expectation, I should say, in evangelical churches about sermons, is that they'll last about 30 minutes or so, give or take. Now, if we do that twice a week, that's one hour. Now, think about that for just a minute. How many hours do our people spend in absorbing the things of the world? It's a whole lot more than one hour. This is why we try to encourage people to read the Bible every day on their own, to talk to God every day, to do family devotions, because we want to reinforce what the Word of God says, not just, well, here's half an hour or so, and that's all you get for the week. I actually had a pastor say to me not too long ago back there in Franklin County, well, I never preach more than five minutes. Five minutes! Folks, I can't even start something in five minutes. Okay? I have cited the difficulty of gathering a crowd as one of the reasons for this flight from preaching. Now, there are others that's become very popular in American churches to refer to those who lead the singing as, what do we call them? Worship leaders. You know what the idea is behind this? Here's the tragic implication. Well, worship ends when the music ends and the preaching starts. Worship is all over when the preaching starts. Folks, that is not true at all. If we understand worship to a mean giving worth to God, ascribing worth to God, or exalting God, we must surely conclude that preaching is indispensable to worship, right? It's indispensable. Nothing exalts God more than His people gladly and seriously listening to the Word of God. You see, good preaching is not just the one speaking. It's those who are listening, too. This current abandonment of preaching may be due in part to the fact that the word preaching is widely considered to be something that is negative and unpleasant. What do you hear people say? Don't preach at me. This is the comeback you always hear. Don't preach at me. John R.W. Stott rightly said, To preach has come to me to give advice in an offensive, tedious, or obtrusive manner. Preaching has come to mean talking down to people. There you are, up above. How dare you look down on us and speak to us like that? Who do you think you are? The word has become so unpopular that many pastors don't even call preaching anymore. What do they say? Well, we're going to share from the Word of God. That's what they say. They don't even call preaching anymore. We're just going to share something with you, brothers. That is sickening. It appears to mean saying lots of things that will entertain them and amuse them. And absolutely nothing that will upset them. I like what John Piper says. Laughter seems to have replaced repentance as the goal of many preachers. Laughter means people feel good. It means that they like you. It means you have moved them. It means you've become some measure of power over them. It seems to have all the marks of successful communication. If the depth of sin and the holiness of God and the danger of hell and the need for broken hearts is left out, of course. He says, I have been literally amazed at conferences where preachers mention the need for revival and then proceed to cultivate an atmosphere in which it could never come because they don't talk about what really brings and leads to revival. He also says sometimes... It seems that levity is the greatest enemy of any true spiritual work being done in the hearers. You know how this works. Leave them laughing. Again, pastor back where I am, every sermon, without fail. I've seen him do this. If you think this is odd, this is true. I've actually him do it. He starts every sermon with a joke, and I'm even talking about funeral messages. Because you can't ever be sad about anything. It's tragically true that we can cultivate this frivolity that undermines and destroys the gravity of the gospel. I fear that many pastors have the wrong motive in their ministry. They would never openly admit this, but they are driven by the desire to build a religious empire for themselves. And I'm not just talking about the TV preachers. Being the head of such an empire, after all, does have its perks, you know. A large and growing church means one is known as a successful pastor. And successful pastors make good salaries and live in nice homes. They also get invited to speak in prestigious conferences like this one. But folks, it all comes with a price tag. To have this large and growing church means that the pastor must attract people and hold them, keep them. 
What does it take these days to attract and hold people? Well, you've got to be warm, you've got to be likable, and above all else, you must be funny. Not funny looking like me, but funny. You've got to be funny. See? In American society, laughter has become self-authenticating. If something is funny, it's automatically right and good because after all, it gave me the warm fuzzies that I left with a chuckle. Woe to the pastor who is too serious about things. Part of being likable is preaching a message that won't disturb people. Sin, guilt, wrath, hell, holiness, repentance, that's all out the window in this mad desire to make everybody feel good about themselves. Now, never mind, pay no attention to the fact that all these things, things like sin, guilt, wrath, hell, holiness, repentance, these were all things that were prominent in the preaching of Jesus. I mean, after all, what would he know about modern-day audiences, right? That's where we've come. That's where we find ourselves. Ambition. But I have a word to say about that. Folks, the flock is not there for our personal advancement. You are there for the welfare of the flock. Now we can also become sick with prayerlessness and the disease of materialism as well. And yes, something that's running rampant in pastors these days seems like this, is this disease rather of untamed, unrestrained sexual desire. We see pastor after pastor falling because they will not do what's necessary to stay away from those things. In spite of all the admonitions and warnings the Bible gives, they don't do it and they go towards it instead of away from it. All of these things, brothers in Christ, can afflict us into the measure that they afflict us, they hinder our performance as faithful shepherds in the flock of God, and they hinder the flock. See, the same thing, if you'll take your Bibles and go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4, listen to what Paul, the same writer here, or the same one that's speaking here in Acts, says to the young pastor, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Same words. 1 Timothy 4, 16, and just keep this over. We'll be coming back to this in just a few moments. He says, take heed to yourself. There it is. Take heed to yourself. Same thing. Take heed to yourself. Paul is saying the same thing to this young pastor. If we want to have churches that nurture new lambs, folks, we must watch out for ourselves. We must take heed to ourselves and be careful that we are doing what God's called us to do. And you and I, brothers in Christ, must not take this warning lightly. Oh, how we need pastors today who are faithful. And if we are faithful... We must guard ourselves against these things that afflict so many pastors today. Well, quickly, moving on here. Not only must we pay attention, special attention to ourselves here as pastors, but I want to move on to a second thing here. I not only want to talk about you as pastors, under shepherds of the flock, and I could say a lot more about that. But there's much more to be said about these other points as well. And here's the second one. I also want to talk to you about your flock, the sheep. Go back with me to Acts chapter 20 and look at verse 28 again. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. To all the flock. There you have Paul saying to these Ephesian elders, take heed to all the flock. Not part of the flock, some of the flock, half the flock, all the flock. He says further there, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Did you notice something there in verse 28? I know some of you sharp minds out there have picked up on this. In that verse 28, you see a Trinitarian formula there. Yes, we have the three persons of the Trinity. You have, first of all, God the Father's here because it is the church of God, Paul says. He says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God. There it is, the church of God, God the Father. That's the one we're shep- that, those are the ones we're shepherding. And yes, God the Son is there because he says this flock is purchased, he says, with his own blood. Whose own blood? The blood of Jesus. And God the Holy Spirit is there because he says, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Holy Spirit's the one that's called us. That's how it's supposed to be, right? We're called by God to go into the ministry to preach God's word, not something else. This is the flock of God, purchased by the blood of Christ, over whom the Holy Spirit has appointed us. This means, brothers in Christ, we have this great, great privilege 
This is a privilege, not a, just a drudgery, but a privilege. We are called to shepherd that which the triune God himself is involved. Oh, I understand pastoring can be and often is monotonous at times and can become very difficult. I've been through that. I understand that. But let's be honest about this. Who among us would say, well, I just want a church where there's no problems. Well, good luck with that because there aren't any. Have you figured this out? Churches have problems. Why? Because there are people in churches and people have problems. That's how this goes. Pastoring can be sheer drudgery, if we're honest about it, at times. When this happens, we must stop and shake ourselves. Remind ourselves when we complain about the hardship of the pastorate. The difficulty of the pastorate that we have been given is a great privilege. We are involved in a work that has occupied the three persons of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. It is the church of God. It is purchased by the blood of Christ. And the Holy Spirit is involved because He is setting men over the flock of God as shepherds. It is God's church. Back there in eternity past, God in His sovereign grace chose unto Himself a people for His name and for His honor and for His glory. How many times do you even hear that in churches? You mean we're not just here to feel good about ourselves? No! It's about God and His honor and His glory. It's a flock that was bought by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a flock that brought the Lord Jesus Christ down from the realms of heaven and glory itself, down to this earth filled with sin and shame. It is a flock that compelled the Lord Jesus Christ to take on our flesh, our humanity upon Himself, not ceasing in any moment, in any way to be God, so that He was at one and the same time fully God and fully man. And in that humanity, He went all the way there to Calvary's cross after living a life of perfect obedience to the law of God, God's law which was holy and just. And there on the cross of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, endured the wrath of God in the place of His people. That's what He did for us, and we get to tell people about it. That is a privilege. That is a privilege. I tell you, my friends, whenever you are involved in shepherding the flock of God, you are involved in something big, something enormous. You're involved with something that reaches all the way from eternity past, runs throughout human history, all the way into eternity future. This is the church of God. That's what you're involved in. What a privilege it is, what a blessing it is to be an under-shepherd in that flock and to realize that this flock was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Folks, that means it is worth something. Amen? It's worth something. Now, I quickly want to say there's a big argument running around in the Southern Baptist Convention today, and I know a lot of you have probably heard about it. it. Seems like there are these nasty people running around called Calvinists, and many profess to be greatly alarmed and shocked and amazed about the resurgence of Calvinism in our midst. One of the issues that is at stake in all of this, of course, is the atonement. And here we're told... In Acts chapter 20, you saw it there, which he purchased with his own blood, down there, verse 28. Verse 28 says, the church was purchased by the blood of Christ. And I'll just take a moment here to get this off my chest. It'll make me feel better, hopefully make you feel better too. I believe, folks, that the nature of the atonement determines the scope of the atonement. So I would ask all of these who debate with us about the extent of the atonement, well, just exactly who was atoned for? I would ask them to explain something here about their understanding of the nature of the atonement. You know what I'm talking about? Practically every Bible-believing Baptist that I know of will go on record saying, yes, I believe in the substitutionary atonement. I believe that Jesus took our place on the cross. He paid the price for us. Yes, I believe that. Well, if they say that, my question is, they are saying that Jesus Christ died only for those who are His people. If they're honest about that, those for whom the Father chose 
back there in eternity past for himself. That's who Jesus died for. Because if that death was a real substitution, then my friends, there is no penalty left for God's people to pay. And that's good news, is it not? That's good news. And we can truly say in the words of the great hymn, Jesus paid it all. Curtis was kidding with me just before we started the session this morning saying, well, Jesus paid some of it in the minds of people. Folks, the song says it plainly. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. If Jesus paid it all, there's nothing left for me to pay or you to pay, right? There's nothing left. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and he washed it white as snow. But if Jesus died for people who end up in eternal destruction, then his death was not substitutionary at all. He did not actually receive the wrath of God in their place because they are receiving that wrath in themselves. I guess this goes back to my childhood where I had this habit of chasing a rabbit every time I scare one up. Well, we'll move on here. Brothers in Christ, we are called to a tremendous task to shepherd the flock of God, and we ask ourselves, how can I ever do this? And one part of the answer that we have to keep in mind is the tremendous privilege of shepherding the flock of God. And these privileges flow from the nature of the flock, and the flock is God's. It belongs to Him. He died for it. He gave His blood for it. Always remember that. It is not our flock. It's God's flock. And again, if more men in the pulpit would just get that through their thick skulls, I am convinced a lot of things would improve if they would understand this belongs to God, not us. God is the one who set his heart upon his people back there in eternity past. It's the flock purchased by the blood of Jesus. It's the flock that the Holy Spirit is involved in because he sets under shepherds over them to take heed to the flock We must be careful not only about the nature of the flock, but also about what we feed them. Obviously, shepherd means to feed. Literally, it means to to shepherdize, means to feed. We are to shepherd the flock, and as you know, that's what the word is all about, feeding the flock so they don't starve. And again, we could go on and on here about how many congregations are starving spiritually because they're not being fed, right? You know that's what's going on. Instead of hearing the gospel, they hear something else. We have no greater responsibility than feeding the flock. But you as pastors are in a tremendous position for you have this abundance of good food to place before your flock. Now get this, the food we are to place before our flocks is the Word of God. And the Word of God is sufficient for every member of the flock. It is milk for the little lambs, the new lambs that come into the flock. It is enough to help them grow as well as meat for those who are mature. As you go to the Word of God to feed the flock of God, you're going to find in this Word of God something that a lot of folks run away from. It's called doctrine. Doctrine. And folks, you are to place the doctrines of this Word before your flock. Again, Paul tells Timothy, I asked you to stay there in 1 Timothy 4. He says to first, to, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, not only to take heed to yourself, but he says, but take heed to yourself and take heed to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And we wonder why we're in the state we're in. We are called, brothers in Christ, to doctrinal preaching. That's what we're called to. And there's nothing sadder than to hear some pastor ridicule doctrinal preaching. Another pastor in our association actually said here, and a pastor's meeting just about a couple months ago, well, our church is going through this financial seminar, how to master your finances, and nothing in all the years of my ministry has ever had such lasting impact as this financial seminar. He said that, folks. Nothing he ever said, nothing he ever taught, nothing he ever preached had this kind of effect. And if you say, well, it must be a tiny little place. There are hundreds of people in this place, the biggest church in our association. People ridicule doctrinal preaching. Any pastor who ridicules doctrinal preaching is basically waving a flag over his head saying, you know, I don't know very much at all. That's what he's doing. And that's being kind about it. And yet we have among us today men who wear this like a badge of honor. I don't preach doctrine, I don't teach doctrine, and I don't believe in doctrine because I don't like doctrine. Years ago, a young man was contemplating attending 
one of our Southern Baptist seminaries, and he was warned to stay away from one of them because they taught bad doctrine. Here's the young man said, actually said this. Let's get something straight here. If I come here, I am not going to, I'm not coming to study doctrine. I'm coming to study the Bible. Well, that's what he said. He was serious about that. I'm not coming here to study doctrine. I'm coming here to study the Bible. Brothers, do not belittle doctrine because doctrine is just simply what the Bible teaches. That's what doctrine is. And you and I are to embrace doctrinal preaching, not shun it, not run from it, not hide from it, not do anything but. How much more of Rocky the raccoon and how to potty train your child are we going to put up with in the pulpit to say, we wonder why nobody knows anything, duh. Because we're not telling them anything. That's why. Oh, how the, great pur- how, how the old Puritans were so good at this. They'd take a passage of Scripture and, and then they'd isolate the doctrine in that passage and that, that was taught by that passage. And they'd put that in the form of their proposition and, and then they'd begin to work it out and, and, and unfold it layer upon layer upon layer. And as you'd read, you, you'd be amazed at how many layers there were from that little passage, that little bit of doctrine there. Paul is our example here. For there in verse 27 of Acts chapter 20, he tells us what he said. He says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He said, I've told you all of it, not just part of it. I like what John Stott said about Paul's ministry to the Ephesians. He said, Paul shared all possible truth with all possible people in all possible ways. He taught the whole gospel to the whole city with his whole strength. And that's what you and I are supposed to be doing. We are to teach the whole truth to all the people we possibly can using all legitimate means We are to feed the flock which is among us, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 2. One more thing. I I said that that if you follow Paul's admonition here, if you are to take heed to the flock of God, you've got to pay special attention to the nature of the flock. You've got to pay special attention to the feeding of the flock. But now I say to you, thirdly, that you must be on guard and you must be watchful. You must watch out from predators, Paul says, from both within... And without. He says, predators from without and perverse men from within. Look at verse 29. He says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. That's from the outside. Predators. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things. That's perversion from within. Folks, you know what's about to happen here in three weeks? These nine people who wear the black robes are going to tell us whether or not marriage is any longer one man and one woman. And they will decide. I've got news for them. That's already been decided. God settled that a long time ago. And yet they're going to say, well, we will decide. This is perversion. Run amok. And we've got pastors. Again, you you must think I live in the worst little town in Franklin County of all, but we had a pastor not too long ago who openly said from the beginning, I'm bisexual. And the search committee knew it, and the church voted anyway. Families left. Got down to about 20, 30 people. He left after about a year, and he lied as he left our little town. He said that he had to live the life of of a hermit. He had to live under just deep oppression because no one would endorse or embrace or agree or approve of what he did. And I'm thinking, that's because God says it's wrong. We must not endorse sin. And this is coming from the pulpit. Now, we know that people like the Judaizers attacked Paul repeatedly. And they influenced the church for a long time. And he also had to fight against the false teaching of the Gnostics that continued to influence the churches for a very long time. And if you still think there's nothing to Gnosticism, well, I refer you to the Da Vinci Code. That comes from a lot of Gnostic teachings and words. Paul had the Judaizer wolf to deal with and the Gnostic wolf to deal with. He had wolves, folks, from without, from outside the church. He says we must be on guard to these wolves. Some would have us believe today that there are no wolves. There are no wolves among us today threatening the flock. That's not true at all. There are many wolves threatening the flock. We still have the Judaizer wolf of today for those who want to add works to the amazing grace of God. 
They say it's not enough to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You must also add works to that. The Judaizers back in the New Testament, they said, well, you've got to follow the law of Moses. It's not enough to follow Jesus. We have this Gnostic wolf today and people who say, well, I have a special knowledge, don't you see? I, I know things other people don't know. I know what the Bible says about certain things. But the Lord spoke to me. I was out witnessing once years ago back in uh, Illinois before I came to Missouri. And a woman from the church was there supposedly helping me witness to this young man. And, and we shared with John what it meant to be saved and how to be saved. And, and I said, John, does this make sense to you? And he said, yes, Bill, it does. And I said, well, are you telling me that not only do you understand this, but you see your need for this and you're ready to ask God for this. He said, no, Bill, I'm not ready. And as sure as I'm standing here, this woman said, well, now, John, this preacher's willing to wait, but I'm not. What's it going to be, John, yes or no? If I could, I would have shot her right there, but I could not do that, so I did not. But her attitude was the same. Well, I know the Bible says this, but the Holy Spirit told me that. Folks, let's be clear about one thing. The Holy Spirit never contradicts the Word of God that He inspired. That makes no sense. That Well, the Holy Spirit said this. No, it, the Holy Spirit says what the Bible says. Always, 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 always. Now, there's also the nice wolf that's running around. You know what I'm talking about. He's, he's loose in our churches today. Here's what he says. It, it's not even a matter of works anymore. You don't even have to do anything. You just be nice to people. Just be pleasant, you know. Say hello to everybody you meet. Don't kick the dog. You know, things like that. And then here's one that I think is really gaining ground with more and more people. It's simply called the salvation by death view. Where all you got to do to go to heaven is just simply kick the bucket. Die. And you're in. You die and you're in. We see it in our newspapers every time some prominent American dies... The, the, the editorial cartoons, they draw a picture of that person up in heaven with a harp and a halo around their head sitting there looking down on all of us. They actually had that picture of George Carlin. Anybody know who George Carlin is? He openly said, there is no God. And of all the world's religions, Christianity is the most toxic. Well, he's in heaven now because he died. No, that's not true. And maybe here's the worst wolf of all. The life management wolf. This has taken our Southern Baptist churches by storm. Where we set aside the clear teachings of the Word of God and we teach people practical ways to make their life better. To make their way through the crises of life. These folks just want to give their people something to just get them through money. Preacher, I know you talk about eternity, but man, give me something to get me through Monday. Eternity and the eternal God will get you through Monday. These folks just look at heaven and they say, well, you know, it does beat the other place, of course, but I guess it's just a plus to my life, you know, side benefit. Shocking things happen to Scripture when we adopt this model. Years ago, one of our prominent Southern Baptist convention preachers actually preached the, the message about Gabriel telling Mary that she's a, Jesus was about to be born to her and... Uh, Rather than talk about how this was God's eternal plan of coming down in human flesh and advancing His ideas of the kingdom, here's what this preacher did with that. He said, well, this is how you deal with the interruptions in life. You know, Mary's just minding her own business, walk along one day, and hey, angel comes, you're going to have the Messiah. Oh, well, how about that? What will I do about the interruptions in my life? Oh, my. Now, folks, I've got to be honest with you. I've never heard anything like that before in my life. That's a new one for me. Or how about this one? Story of David and Goliath. Well, no, it's not a story about God delivering his people. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. It's how to kill the giants in your life. As if this life is all that matters. I mean, after all, isn't that what that book was called? Your Best Life Now? Folks, our best life is later. Not now. It's later. Because if, if it was so great now, why are there so many problems in it? The story of Jacob and Esau. No, no, it's not about God's plan through time and generation. No, no. It's about dysfunctional families, don't you see? That's not what that is. 
The reason why so many do this is because all of this makes us seem to be smarter than God, wiser than God. People will not tolerate preaching about sin and righteousness and repentance and judgment. If they want a crowd, they better preach what people want to hear. Find out what people want and make sure you give it to them. Maybe the worst example of this at all is Jesus' own life. No, it was not about God coming down here and t- becoming one of us and ta- taking and our sins and paying for the price of our sins. Oh, no, no, it's not that. Why, Jesus' life is just filled with leadership principles. Don't you know? That's what they say. Quickly, one word and then we'll pray. Go with me to verse 37 of Acts chapter 20. We've talked about you as the pastor and your flock. But I want you to look at verse 37. And that is your neck. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more. They fell on Paul's neck and they kissed him. A lot of consolation here, a lot of encouragement here in this scene. These men realized how much they owed Paul. These men had a great appreciation for the Apostle Paul. And I wanted to give some encouragement today because I know I have needed it. And I am blessed by men who are in this group today who have given it to me, who have prayed for me. And I want to give some back to you. We are, stand, we are trying to stand for truth in a day that despises the truth. Some in your own congregations may think you're a pretty odd duck. You're a pretty odd number. You're some sort of oddball to preach about these things that aren't popular anymore. Why, preacher, we're so sophisticated. We're beyond that. We don't need to hear about sin anymore. I actually had a woman say to me in a church in Illinois years ago, Why do you keep calling us sinners every Sunday? Because you are one! Well, aren't you? Yes, I am too. Uh, That's where we are, folks. Here's a word of encouragement, though. These men wept. They fell on his neck and they kissed him. Because they knew they owed a lot to Paul. Because Paul had given them the word of God. And here's some good news, some encouragement. If you think you're out there by yourself and you think it doesn't matter anymore and you think nobody cares, here's some good news. The word of God can and does still save. It saves. So don't give up. Keep preaching until you hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. May God help you, brothers. And keep on helping you. Keep preaching. Keep laboring. Until at last, when you go to stand before him, he says to you, well done, good and faithful servant. And then he shows you this long line of people behind him. And you ask, Lord, who are those people? And he says, I'll let them come and tell you. And they come and they fall on your neck. And they weep on your neck. And they kiss you. Then you'll be glad you took heed to yourself and to your flock. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for faithful men who have spurned the sweet siren song of this age. The voice that has told them to give up and discard this old gospel. Thank you, God, that there are men who would rather die than give up their allegiance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. And every one of us today can think of some great faithful shepherd that was used by you, God, in our salvation. And we say, truly, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good tidings. I think, Father, that old, common, ordinary preacher who faithfully preached the gospel and has now gone home to glory after the sword of the gospel claved to his hand for many years. And how he told me the truth of who you are and who your son is and how real my sin was and how somebody had to pay for it. And I was not able to pay for it. And yes, Father, I want to weep on his neck And thank Him for being a faithful shepherd. Lord, would You make us faithful shepherds in these days? 
Would you help us to go all out, fearing nothing but our master's displeasure? Please, God, would you bless these men who serve you, who preach your word. Use them to the eternal praise and honor and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.